get my granddaughter up here to bang on it. Let's <laughs> just stand up and join us this morning. Welcome to Tree of Life in Pflugerville, Texas. If you're joining online, we just invite you to enter in with us. The King of Glory is in this place. Watching it online, he's right there with you also. Come on, just begin to acknowledge his presence this morning. Open up your gates, begin to tell him how thankful you are. Come on, just begin to bless him this morning. We come as priests into the kingdom, into his throne room to bless the King of Glory. Like a river. Hang on, Kino. Hang on. <laughs> Kino's excited. Come on, just welcome him this morning. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to move. Come and move through this place. Come have your way. We join with all creation. Declare you alone are worthy. You alone are holy. We bless you. We give you all.
know, to walk in your destiny and to understand it's a destination and a journey, but know that you have a destiny. And we are going to now declare that we are moving forward, that we are moving into our destiny. Destinies are not cut short. Destinies shall prevail, and we are victorious in that destiny. So today, we declare victory and uh, accomplishment. We are going to walk this out and achieve our destinies. Hallelujah.
it's your blood. Speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. Your blood speaks a better word. A better word. you 
And so, Father, as we go forth this morning here, and Father, we pray for each and every person in this congregation and online, those that are dealing with sickness and disease, Father, we curse it at the root. We declare that healing is their portion. Father, those that are lacking in finances, Father, you said you would supply every need according to your riches. Father, those that have turmoil in their hearts and their spirits, we thank you that, Father, you are the peace that passes all understanding. And so we thank you for that today, Lord. You're a good, good Father. You're a good God. And we thank you, Lord, that great is your faithfulness to your people here and the worldwide, Father. You are faithful to your people. And we thank you for that today. We give you the glory and you the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. God's good, isn't he? He's a good God. You know, as we see everything, everything going on around about us in this world and everything, I'm just so thankful that we have the rock, the solid rock, Jesus Christ, who is our foundation. Amen? Things rattle and roll amongst us and underneath us, but the rock of Jesus Christ is strong, and he is faithful to his people. Amen? And I thank him for that. And you know, a lot of people, um, as I believe the end times are nearing. You know, they, they were like, how do we pray? How do we pray? How do we pray? How do we pray? You know, because things are going to happen because there's prophecies in the Bible that says these things. Amen. And we can't change what God has prophesied and what he says is going to happen here on this earth. We just have to trust that what he's begun, he's going to finish. Amen. And as we walk through it, we walk with grace and dignity in the Lord. Amen. And that he is faithful. He is very, very faithful to his people. So I just want to encourage you in that today. He is a faithful God. And um, if you don't know how to pray, pray thy kingdom come and your will be done, God, as it is in heaven. Amen. Because he has it in the palm of his hand, everything and all things that are going on. He is all-knowing. Well, it's good to be here today. I'm glad that you're with us and in the house of the Lord. And uh, we just welcome each and every one of you here today. Thank you for being with us. Those online, we welcome you. Um, the, if you're a first-time guest, there's a little form on here that you can fill out. Or if you're online, you can hit the Get Connected button. If you have a prayer request, put that in here. We would love to pray over your prayer requests and believe God to intervene on our behalf and your behalf and his behalf. Amen? Because he's a good, good God and he loves to move mountains on your behalf. Amen? He's good and he's faithful. We, um, we welcomed our little grandson this uh, past week. Uh, he's as cute as a button. Um, he's cute, cute, cute. Oh, is his picture up here? Oh, there he is, Theodore Daniel. He's so cute. And he looks like that all the time. He's so peaceful and he's just sailing along. He was a cutie. He was 6.5 pounds, I think 18 inches, 18 and a half inches long. And Miss Kristen did a fantastic job. She just did great. And I was able to be there for the birth, and what an amazing event that is, you know. God just gives us life, and life more abundant, amen. So, um, yeah, she is at home doing great and, and uh, recovering and recuperating. So it's, it's um, awesome. This is my sixth grandchild. I said, okay, hold up now. It's, hold up. That's a lot of grandbabies to buy Christmas for, you know. Hold up there. So um, but we're excited and very, very grateful. Um, we just want to welcome you here today and let you know that this Wednesday night, uh, we're going to be continuing with our series, uh, Created to Dream. So, you know, when I heard about the series, I was like, hmm, what, what is my dream and, and what is my vision in life? And, you know, things change. Our visions change. Dreams change as you accomplish one and move on to the next. And it's been very good being encouraged to stand in faith, to see what God is doing on our, our behalf. So be here at 6.45, and the study begins at 7. Also, our donations for Bible is going great. Uh, thank you for donating um, to that. We've been able to send, I think, four boxes of Bi five boxes of Bibles to Hawaii to help replenish all the Bibles that got burned up. And so we're excited, and thank you for helping out with that. And uh, we really appreciate it. Um, our prayer meeting is going to be next month, the 2nd, 
put that on your calendar. Thank you so much for being there and, and uh, praying for us and the nations. And I really, um, I watched a special, not a special, a, a friend of mine who covers a lot about Israel over in Israel, and she has a guy there um, that she talks to that is very friendly with. And I watched an interview with them last night. She was actually live on um, video with them. And please keep Israel in your prayers. Um, it, was, it was a very demonic planned attack on a holy day and a celebration over there in Israel, and they were totally unprepared, and there's lots of casualties, so just keep Israel in your prayers. God says to pray peace, amen, over that nation, so keep them in your prayers. Um, this, today is Pastor Appreciation Day, and so we appreciate that. Um, and want to let you know there's cupcakes right after service, I believe, in the foyers. So help yourself to cupcakes. I don't want to take them home. So make sure you eat them, all right? Take one home for your kiddos or grandkids or hubby and, and share them and share them alike. And um, we would also, uh, we're just going to let them show a video this morning um, for pastors' appreciation. And thank you so much for, for blessing us here as your pastors and just for, for being here and um, being a blessing to all our pastors here and our leaders um, on staff. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Dear Pastor, the Bible says to recognize those who care for you in the Lord. So today, we want to take a moment to honor you. For all you do through the stage and all you do behind the scenes. We want to say thank, thank you. you. For praying that we would know and follow Jesus all the days of our life. For leading us through hard times into an exciting but uncertain future for teaching us God's word faithfully, boldly, and practically. For equipping us to do God's work in God's way, for God's glory. For caring about our lives, our friends, our families, and our futures. For being with us in our greatest joys and in our darkest hours. For sharing not only the gospel with us, but also for sharing your life with us as well for showing us what it's like to walk well with Jesus. For being our pastor. We recognize you, we believe in you, we honor you, and we thank you today. I was blessed with a very loud voice. Um, so, Mr. Greg, would you please come up? Mm-hmm. You know, it, this is such an honor, but when I was asked if I would say a few words, I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> hmm. So, um, I wanted to be able to express the qualities of a great worship leader. And so, I did a little research, and I found some... Um, information that Curtis Parks, I'd never heard of him, but um, had posted and written, and it's so applicable. So one of the things that he said was so true, anyone can lead a song, anybody can, but only a true worshiper can lead the church. And somebody who is a true worshiper it doesn't just show up on Sundays and lead. That's their lifestyle daily, the things they do behind the scenes, the countless hours writing, you know, um, Greg has to spend countless hours behind the scenes for every new song that we sing. He has to transpose it into every instrument um, that's up here so they can play it. So it's a lot of work um, and a labor of love for that. Um, so there are four um, great qualities of a great worship leader, one is humility. Humility says, there you are, not here I am. Um, authenticity 
He worships in spirit and in truth, and that is so Greg. You show up every week at practice. The things you don't see when Greg shows up for practice, he's not just here to practice. He's here to prepare the way to lead us into worship. Integrity is um, character, and it really wants you... Oh, and sorry, integrity is character that says, I really want you to have an encounter with God. And that's what this is about. That's what worship is about. That is so Greg's heart. I know you don't get to talk to him. That is his heart. Every morning, every service, he wants you to have an encounter with the Lord. He wants you to enter in, and he wants to make that way for you. And then excellence. And as worship leaders, excellence isn't the destination, which that was the word of the Lord today, right? It is destination. But excellence isn't a destination, God's presence is the destination, and excellence is the road that takes us there. And truly, truly, you are the leader that takes us there. Thank you. Milton and Angelique are great youth pastors, and they have made a great impact in my life. They always make sure that the youth class is engaging and people are having fun. They plan fun games and icebreakers that help our youth group bond better and make the content of the lessons more engaging for everyone. All their lessons have helped me be on the right path to feel closer to God and strengthen my faith. And the snacks they always bring are very nice, too. <laughs> I cannot express my gratitude to Milton and Angelique for coming to church every Sunday and not only presenting the youth with great lessons, but the activities that they plan outside of church as well that provide a great sense of belonging to everyone. Thank you. morning. I'm Linda Wasson, and yes, I was upstairs, so if I'm a little winded, it's running downstairs, going to get the preschool kids. So um, I would like Pastor Cheryl to come up if she could. Um, all right, so today I get the honor and privilege of sharing my appreciation for Pastor Cheryl on part of the women's ministry. Um, I've been at this church a little over 11 years and have had really gotten to know Pastor Cheryl pretty good. Um, during this time, I've learned that she's kind. Not only is she beautiful, she's dependable, wise, and she is very wise, honest, driven, driven to where she ran a 5K, taught herself how to quilt, I mean, just driven. Um, loves to have fun. Some of the stories I could tell you, but we don't have enough time. So, um, and has, <laughs> and has a great sense of humor. Um, I've come to her for counseling during my rough years with some teenagers, um, situations that have been very difficult for me, whether it be a death of a loved one or She's been there for me, and I just totally appreciate her. She's been an encourager to me, um, sharing tips and everything on, like, how to lose weight or, um, you know, just different things to encourage my walk also as a woman of God and as a child of God. I have come to her for help, for prayer, and she is a rock. Um, I truly appreciate her for that. She hears the Lord. She really does. And um, I, I just want to give her honor. And so I'm going to do this. If you are part of the Women of Worth leadership team, would you please stand up? Thank you. If you have been 
encouraged by Pastor Cheryl, whether it's by her scripture sharing every Sunday or just a word of knowledge, stand up. If you have come to her for counseling during a rough time, stand up. If you have asked her for prayer and you know she's been praying for you, stand up. Everybody here loves you so much and are just blessed to have you in our lives, and me especially, because not only is she my pastor, she's my friend, and I love her dearly. So thank you. Good morning. My name is Scott Seavers. I'd like Pastor Mike to come up, if you could. Uh, I've been asked to represent the whole church in uh, giving you appreciation and thank you for all you do, which is a huge task. How do you put into words all the gratitude the whole church feels about everything you've done? So when we first came here, we were looking not for a friendly church. We were looking for friends at a church, and uh, you were that friend, right? We, right from the very beginning... You were very personable. There was no separation between, you know, you know, we could approach you. You have actually came and approached us first, and you were so friendly and a friend to us that it blew us away. We didn't know what to think. You know, normally there's like, we can't talk to pastor. You have to go through different layers of people to get to, to pastor. So we appreciate you being so personable. Um, and then taking time. Before and after church, we know you're super busy. There's so many things probably going through your mind before church to get ready, but you take time and actively listen how we're doing. And you're like, wait a minute, who has time? You've, you've got a thousand things in your mind, but you make eye contact, you ask questions, you're actively listening and checking up on us to see how we're doing. We appreciate each and every one of those times. And... Um, I have to say, another thing that kept us here is the birthday blessings. It's so, it's like we're all family. Every time you do a birthday blessing, a personalized birthday blessing, nobody else does that. But it feels like we're family. It feels like, you know, we're all together and you've taken the time to pray about each and every one of us and, and hear a word from God and then deliver that message to us. It blows us away each time. And... Um, and the greeting cards, you know, we've had people pass away in our family or our, our birthday, some happy times, whatever the occasion. We get a personalized greeting card in the mail. That must take a lot of time, not just a simple text and text and text, but not a simple text. You take the time to put it in the mail, put a stamp on it, send it out there. And every time I get it, I'm like, wow, this is a letter from Pastor. Look, Anna Lou, I got a letter. I got a letter from Pastor. And um, it really just amazes and blows us away. I thank, can't thank you so much for each of those. Um, for every time you've encouraged us when we've been down, um, every time you've encouraged us to strive for a deeper relationship with Christ, um, you, you've always pointed us towards God, always pointed us towards Jesus. Um, we appreciate each of the, your service and ministry. You've blessed us tremendously with, with each of those. Um, you are a good shepherd. And you've, you've always been there, always been faithful, always answered the call. And so behalf, on behalf of the whole church, we'd like to tell you thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm back because I am here because Miss Kristen's not. And <laughs> so I'm honoring uh, Kristen today right here. Uh, yes, we love you. If you're watching, you better be watching. No, just kidding. Um, uh, it's kind of hard to, for me to honor her. She's my daughter. <laughs> so, um, but if there's anybody that I can really truly brag upon, it is Kristen. She is the most faithful, dedicated children's pastor 
And not only children's pastor, she also works in the office. So she does a lot of office work and touches every ministry in this church. And um, the faithfulness of her and the never-ending doing and doing and going is amazing. Um, I had to basically beg her to take maternity leave. And let me tell you, she's still at home on that text, controlling it all. Don't worry about that. But um, she, is, um, she is faithful. She's been with us since we started here. I mean, there's children that went through her nursery and, and, and kids' church that are now married and having babies. Um, she's been here a long time, and she has never, never stepped back. She always has a word of encouragement. Um, if there's ever a day that we have a bad day, we just talk to Kristen, and she will lift you up, let me tell you. And um, she is, she's amazing. She, she never has a bad thing to say about anybody or anything. She's an amazing young lady that way. Um, somebody raised her well. It must have been him. <laughs> must have been him. Um, uh, she actually is very much like her dad, and um, uh, he, she has the same desires and qualities, and she is set apart to be a minister of the gospel. She definitely is called of God, no doubt about it. And we appreciate you today, Kristen. And I get double nice flowers because I don't have any for you. Sorry, I'm the only one. But you got flowers for the baby. But she did have her little baby this week, um, and he was precious. And we're very proud of her and and the family. But she also has um, a sidekick, which is Jeremy. And let's not forget that. Jeremy is also here every Sunday he can and is her sidekick and helps her and supports her. And so we uh, uh, honor her and we honor Jeremy and also her family. August and Caleb are always here and always helping and honoring in every way in VBS and all the extra things they do. They have great attitudes and uh, we just want to honor the children's department and the nursery department today that Kristen is over and, and thank her so much for doing all that she does. Amen. And uh, we pray she's here forever and ever because she is a blessing and always fills in the gaps. Amen. So we really appreciate that. All right. At this time, we just want to thank everybody for honoring all of our staff and our leaders, you know, um, I'm going to give this to Pastor now, but I also just want to say thank you to our leaders and our volunteers, because we would not be pastors here and able to do what we do if, it, if we didn't have them. And uh, one a person that I would like to uh, honor today also is Jack. Jack is our elder here at the church, and Jack always goes an extra mile. Yes, he deserves that. We appreciate you, Jack. He's probably... Um, one of pastor's greatest sounding boards, and he's a great sounding board because he will always tell you the truth, and he will always encourage you, and he is always helpful in every way. He does so much at the church, and we appreciate you, Jack, too. We honor you today, and every other person that volunteers and does great and mighty things here at the church, it takes everybody, and so we thank you, and uh, we honor you today, too. All right? Thank you very much. So pastor's going to come up. If you want to hand out offering envelopes, that's great. If the youth are going upstairs, they can be dismissed. So thank you. All right. <clears throat> thank you very much for all that honoring time. It may go to our head. But we do appreciate you folks. It takes uh, the congregation to, have a, to be in ministry, of course, as well. And um, we just appreciate the years they've been with you folks, watching you grow and develop and just be blessed of God in so many great ways. As they're handing out these offering envelopes, um, I want to let you know this coming Wednesday night again for this Discovering God's Dream for Your Life. It's going to be about making wise decisions this coming Wednesday. So try to be, uh, be a part of that. Try to come in here for that. We'll have some snacks at 645, not 630, but 645. And you'll enjoy that also. And everyone he's teaching so far has been really good. Uh, from our brother here from the West Coast here, Rick, uh, Rick Warren. So we appreciate him. Um, also, as far as birthdays go, um, we have several people in our congregation, some that are outside as well. In the Sanders family, Dave Sanders' daughter is Erin. Her birthday is this week. As I prayed about her last night, I received Psalms 29, verse 10 and 11. It says, the Lord rules over the floodwaters. The Lord reigns as king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses them with peace. I believe God's great peace is going to be upon him. And um, as our, our, our lights up as bright as they get. They're up as bright as they go. 
that helps you out a bit too. Um, also now in the Grable family, are the Grables here today? They're away, so um, I'll just get something to them. Um, maybe online, just if you're watching online, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 7 says, But for those who are righteous, the way is not steep and rough. But you are a God who does what is right, and you smooth out the path ahead of them. So I believe there's going to be a time of God smoothing out some great paths for this uh, teenager, I believe, named Jordan. In any kind of rough place that may be there, God's going before you to make rough places smooth. Amen? Amen. Um, now, Damien Hancock, our female usherette, has a son named Dylan. Dylan's turning, what, about 19? 19 years old? So tell... So write down for Dylan, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 says, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So whatever uh, Dylan's going through today, the God saw the beginning, but God also sees the end. And so just know that God sees that for Dylan's life. And it's going to be, I believe, a time where he's going to see himself being drawn nearer and nearer to him as this year progresses. Amen. Michael Lawson's upstairs with the children. And uh, Proverbs chapter um, 8, verse 7 and 17, he says, For I speak the truth, I detect every kind of deception. I love all who love me, and those who search will surely find me. And so I'll give that to him as well. He's a, a man who hates deception, but loves God. And God's going to use that hatred for deception in good ways for him this year. Also, a shout out to uh, <clears throat> Jennifer Falk. Is the Falks here? Um, I don't have really a scripture for Jennifer. I don't know her so well, but I'll be praying ab about her perhaps this week here. Whenever I don't know somebody really well, you'd be amazed that I'm, I'm praying for you folks for birthdays. It takes me sometimes 10 to 15 minutes before the Holy Spirit gives me a verse for someone. And someone I don't know very well, it can take up to 30 minutes uh, sometimes before... Um, uh, I'm just sitting there speaking in tongues, I'm, I'm listening, and sometimes the Holy Spirit just won't even talk to me about it, just won't, won't give me anything. So uh, that's the way that it was to Jennifer, I'm not saying that it's good or bad, I'm just saying uh, as I'm praying for her, it's like there's just a blank so far. So I'll keep on praying about Jennifer, and we'll see what God may give me for uh, her for next week as well. Did I miss any birthday, folks? Just raise your hand if you're a birthday person today or this week. All right, well, as far as anniversaries go, this is the anniversary week for Sean and Iris. I'm right on that, I believe, right here, God bless this couple. This is what number now for you guys? <laughs> number seven. So seven in heaven. And uh, we actually did their wedding for them on a, on a cruise ship seven years ago. So praise God for that also. And uh, you guys have had a great time together. May God bless this year coming up for you. Anybody else having an anniversary I might have missed? All right, let's have our ushers come to the front. Let's pray over these offerings today again. And uh, we believe God that he's going to take and bless these folks that are having birthdays. And uh, ask God to take and bless the offering and bless this great, tremendous couple here having an anniversary this week. So, Father, we do thank and praise you that these birthday people, O oh God, those that are born for such a time as this, that you, God, give them grace, give them direction, give them wisdom. Let the favor of God be upon them. Help them, God, hear your voice ever more clearly. We praise you, God, they're going to bear lasting fruit. We speak to them divine protection, divine provision. And we praise you, God, there's going to be a, a time in their lives where they see even more people coming into your kingdom because, God, of their testimony of what, God, you've done in their lives. Bless, O God, Sean and Iris with their anniversary. May it be the best year they've had yet together as a couple. Let their light so shine before men that men will see their good works and then glorify you in heaven in due time. We also bless what's sown today in this offering. May it be used, O God, for your glory. We pray, God, you rebuke the devourer for thy name's sake in our behalf. Help us, Lord, but God, be wise stewards of all that you give to us. And we give praise and thanks for all these things. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. <clears throat> all right. Um, if you have your Bibles, let's go right into uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. And uh, we're on this series here again that's called Going to the Topics. Um, I trust you guys again if you had any kind of a suffering here from that hailstorm that you're getting recovery from that, and we're going to pray that no more storms like that hit this city until Christ returns, amen? And he can send all the hell he wants to send once we're all out of this, off this planet. And do like Cheryl said, do you keep on playing, praying for Israel? That's going to be the focal point of the last days because the, the d devil knows that if he can destroy Israel, he destroys the Word of God. Because the Bible is very clear that Israel will not be destroyed. It will always be a nation that God blesses and God protects. And so thank God they're going to see Israel come to Christ when he is really is as well in this coming year and decade. 
<clears throat> last week I was talking about dealing with stress, and today I'm going to talk about dealing with anxiety. Stress is about pressure that comes from the outside in. Anxiety comes from the inside and then starts working out. This again was done also by a survey done in, in mega churches about what do Christians want to hear from pulpits? What's their main topics they need to hear about? Number one was stress. Number two was anxiety and depression. And so many folks in the body of Christ are suffering from a whole lot of anxiety and depression in this hour and this season. The Bible tells us in the last days, it says such fearful times will come upon the earth. The hearts of many men, the hearts will fail them. But again, the Bible tells us, Jesus Christ himself says, in this world, you will have tribulation, which means pressure. But he says, be of good cheer because I have overcome this world. So realizing and knowing how, what he means by that only happens by being filled with, baptized in the Holy Spirit and let the Spirit of God rule and reign in your heart as only he can do. Amen. So we mentioned this again, stress is outside in. This is anxiety inside out. Much of today's teaching and ministry, this whole message here comes from Chris Hodges. Pastor Chris Hodges got a book out that's called Out of the Cave. This is a pastor of a church of over 10,000 people in, uh, in the state of Alabama. And uh, he, suffered, he has suffered great depression over his decades of being a minister and a pastor, even though he pastors a hugely successful church. All of his needs are met. His family all loves God. Got a great, tremendous, strong marriage, great staff. You think all those things would always add up to happiness and peace on the earth. But some folks, for some reason, have got a propensity towards anxiety and depression that may come through the bloodline. I don't know what all it comes from. Chemical imbalance sometimes takes place. This man said that during the um, COVID pandemic, his church, like all churches, went from 10,000 people to 10 people. We were, by law, could not have churches meet with more than 10 folks at a time. And so he said, uh, in our church, it just threw him into a total tailspin. He started getting death threats from people. They were saying things like, if my grandma goes to your church and dies, I'll kill you. You know, things like that taking place. And that good, that good news for a pastor. And uh, these things were happening there for death threats and for all kinds of you know, things going backwards as far as attendance goes. And just your whole life just gets sp spinning out of control in many ways. And so he said, I went into such anxiety and depression from that that I found myself in my backyard totally numb. And by the grace of God, some close pastor friends of mine, after several days went by, came to me and said, I'm not leaving this place till you get healed up and get right and get your heart strong once again in Jesus Christ. And those folks helped to rescue him in that. Now, <clears throat> I've been blessed like Kristen has as well. Like Cheryl said, Kristen is the most, one, most childlike myself, I guess. And neither one of us ever suffered depression. And so that's a blessing because I, I don't know what it's like to be depressed. I get discouraged sometimes. I get mad sometimes. I get frustrated sometimes. Like whenever people are on the two or three yard line playing the Sooners and they can't get the ball across the uh, goal line and win the game by uh, more than three points. That's, that's very, very frustrating. But I don't get depressed and I don't get oppressed. And so I, I don't relate totally to folks that live in depression on a regular basis. But my brother, he was a manic depressant. My brother died younger than he should have because of being a, being a manic depressant. And so I've seen what depression looks like. I've seen what it does in a destructive way in people's lives. And I do know that God does not want you bound by anxiety or depression. Amen. 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 And I believe who the Son sets free will be free indeed. So truth comes to bring us freedom. The truth we know will set us free. Anxiety, according to this book again that he wrote, this, again, this pastor did um, three years of research read dozens of books about depression and anxiety and found some tremendous revelation from God's Word and from people that actually minister to those bound by depression that actually have helped out thousands around the world today. They found that anxiety is not a malfunction of your mind. It's a signal that your body is trying to tell you something. Your body will take and start breaking down and start malfunctioning. And sometimes even seizures come on and things like that. When great depression and great anxiety takes over your life, your heart may be healthy, your body may be strong, but your mind, your soul is at, at dis-ease and is causing manifestations inside your body that are negative that shows that something is wrong. There are nine major causes they found of anxiety and depression. Two of these have to do with things that happen to you, also things that you do to yourself. That's two of those. 
Elijah, I'm going to speak about him today from 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah the prophet does seven of these things that brings on depression and brings on anxiety in 1 Kings chapter 19. And again, this book is called Into the Cave. You might want to write that down, look it up on your internet, order that book. You may find that book in Christian bookstores like Mardell. It'd be worth buying that and reading that. It'll really help you out or someone out that you know who may be suffering from anxiety or depression. If we rely upon biology and medication alone to help with anxiety and depression, we're going to miss the real solution to that. Because medication and biology by themselves cannot set you free. You need the Holy Spirit. You need God. You need God's Word. And you also need God's truth to have real freedom take place in these areas of your life. So in 1 Kings chapter 18, it's a story about Elijah having the greatest time of ministry in his life. 850 prophets of Baal come together to defy the living God. And Elijah says, if your God is God, then you go ahead and have him show up here and burn up all this water and burn up all this sacrifice up around this altar. And of course, we know the story there. They could not do that. They slashed themselves till blood flowed with swords. They whipped themselves. They chanted. They did all kind of demonic things. And nobody shows up. Demons don't show up. And the water or, or, the, or the sacrifice remains there. And then Elijah shows up and says, now pour water over the sacrifice, pour water till it flows into the trough here, make it totally impossible that this thing will burn up unless God shows up. And God does show up, fire from heaven comes down, burns up all the sacrifice, licks up all the water in the trough, and then they kill the 850 prophets of Baal. Elijah's best days of ministry took place in that time. Wouldn't that be a great revival? Amen. There's prophets of Baal around us right now that are in the spiritual realm. That's why God wants us to be praying against these works of hell in Jesus' name, because they still need to be bound and destroyed and pushed back with God's help and God's people, okay? Now, chapter 19 then begins. I found myself in ministry. After your greatest victories, many times comes the greatest oppression and attack from the devil after it's over, because Satan gets very threatened. He's very angry, and Satan wants revenge. He's very vengeful. So verse, chapter 19, verse 1 comes, Jezebel rises up. She's angry because her prophets are now dead. It looks like the God of, of Israel has risen up there and killed them. And so she says to Elijah, tell this prophet, if by this time tomorrow he's not like, not like one of those dead prophets, it says, uh, I'm going to make sure his head comes off. I'm going to kill him by this time tomorrow. Now the Bible, in a very, very unusual way, it says this. It says, Elijah saw and became afraid and became scared. Now, you'd think that a great man of faith like this would see God delivering him, but somehow, some way, he saw himself being killed. And the Bible says he ran for his life with his servant and took off. And the Bible says they went there and cleared to Beersheba to hide there. Then it says he leaves his servant there, a big mistake, and goes off by himself in the wilderness. Satan will always try to isolate you and get you by yourself in times of crisis, in times of Satan attacking you in some kind of big way. The amazing thing is that there are five things Elijah did do to get out of the cave, and it, in, and it ends up being all answered to us in chapter 19 of Elijah. So I told you guys again in the, in the Bible, a thing called the law of proximity. And that is, every time a problem happens in the Bible, God will normally give verses right after that to show you the solution to that problem. So though God shows us seven reasons that Elijah goes into anxiety and depression, God then gives five ways to get out of anxiety and out of depression. Praise God. Even God good. It's called the law of proximity. So be aware of that. Read in your Bible. But if there's a problem in the Bible, God will many times give answers for that problem right around where you read the problem in the Bible at. So number one is this. The first way to get out of the cave, if you're in the cave, is he took care of his physical needs. Number one, take care of your physical needs. Let's read this. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 5 through 8. It says, Then as Elijah lay and slept under a broom tree, uh, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. It says, then he looked, and there by the head, or by his head, was a cake of bread baked on coals and a jar of, of water. So he ate, he drank, and he lay down again. 
And the angel of the Lord comes back the second time, touches him again and says, now arise and eat again, because the journey is too great for you. So notice the first thing, this Christophany, Jesus Christ before the cross, angel of the Lord is, talks about this Christophany to, takes place here. First thing he does to him is says, go get some sleep and find something to eat. Sometimes all you need to do is just take and get some rest and find some good food. Amen? This the first thing God wants you to do. Not work harder, but take and get a break, get some sleep, and get, new, get your strength renewed once again in the physical realm. Okay, so it says, He went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Some of us that are here today, we are trying to fix things while we're actually too sick to even fix it. You cannot fix things in your spiritual realm if your body is too sick to want to do that. How many want to have a flu-ridden surgeon operate on your kidneys one day? We don't want that, amen? We want that surgeon to be totally healthy, alert, and having all of his cognizance when he puts that knife into our stomach, amen? And God says the same thing about you and me. we got to, first of all, get ourselves healthy, get ourselves strong, get our strength back once again in the natural, physical realm, and then God can start operating on us and bring out the things that He wants removed out of our lives. One researcher on depression said this, we need to talk less about chemical imbalances and more about the imbalances in the way that we live. That's what the problem is anytime we're living in balanced lives. Another researcher said this, we were never designed for the sedentary, sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life most folks are living in today. That's what we're not made to live like. Amen. And so I speak to myself. I speak to all of us here as well. Let's try to find ways to do things that are balanced and try to get as much sleep as we can at night that's going to be balanced. Try to eat some good food, get some kind of exercise if we can, and do things again that gets us out of our house, out of our isolation, into the realms of people around us that make us laugh, that build us up, and actually cause us to have a joy in life instead of more depression being added to our lives. We need to find pace, the pace of grace, they call it in this book, the pace of grace. What we can do and stay sane in life. We are trying to do too much, many of us are. You know, the good motto we hear, or we think is a good motto is, is this. If one is good, then two is better. Amen? If one house is good, then two is better. If one car is good, then two is better. If one dog is good, well, two is better. If one wife is good, then... No, we have to stop there. That's false doctrine and get me hung here. But you know what I'm saying here is our motto many times is if one thing is nice to have, let's work harder and get two of them and double that. God is saying, no, maybe sometimes one is good and contentment with that one brings great gain as far as God's concerned. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 6, it says, better one handful with tranquility and peace than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Amen? So God is telling us, the New Testament even says that, be content with such things as you have. He'll never leave you, nor will He ever forsake you. We need to find a way to unwind instead of living on a to-do list all the time. We might even need to make a thing called a not-to-do list. Amen? Things not to do, because these things wear us out and get us too, too tired. Number two is this. Elijah, first of all, got strengthened back in his body. He slept, he ate, he slept, he ate. Then number two, he cultivated the presence of God. That's the second thing, cultivated the presence of God. First Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 12, goes on and says, And there Elijah went into a cave, and he spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of Israel of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, 
and they are trying to seek and take my life as well. The Lord said back to him, go stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. Notice that, in the presence of the Lord. Then a great wind came, and God was not in the wind. An earthquake comes, God is not in the earthquake. A fire comes, and God is not in the fire. After the fire, a gentle whisper takes place. And this is where God is telling us again, God is showing Elijah his soul. His soul was full of turmoil. It was full of shake, rattle, and roll. It was full of wind and fire and all kinds of explosive things. And God is showing him his soul. And it says God was not in any of that. What God was in is not just killing prophets and seeing fire come down from heaven. He's in a still, small voice in the presence of God. For the gentle whisper takes place once again. We are blessed to have the worship team we have in this, in this church. Amen. Praise God for our singers. Praise God for our musicians. Thank God for Greg leads us in praise and worship. Thank God for these people. But how many folks know this worship here is not just for Sundays only. It's for every day of your life. We need to cultivate a worship life on a daily basis. Spending time praising God, worshiping God, thinking about God, telling God how good He is, thanking God for His goodness. Those things are all things that recharge our batteries. And they drive depression and they drive anxiety away. David the psalmist, he said, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Put your trust in God. He also said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's in me, bless his holy name. He was commanding his soul to go ahead and praise and bless God, even though Saul was trying to kill him. He was saying, I will bless the Lord, O my soul. I will say, All that's in me shall praise his holy name. In Psalm 73, verses 16 and 17, this talks about a man, a psalmist, I think it's David again, who was angry because he saw that unbelievers had the big mansions, the nicest horse, nicest chariots, nicest wives, nicest families, nicest part of town, best education. He said, I was totally angry seeing how the, the unbelievers were being blessed in natural realms around them, and all the people of God seem to be more poor and more or worse off and more persecuted and so forth and so on. And then Psalm 73, verse 16 and 17 says this. When I tried to understand all of this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God. You see, we can find ourselves getting troubled and envying folks around us who are doing things that are wicked and evil thinking that they're the standard of what we should be living like ourselves. But I want to say again, for wicked foes, those who don't know Christ as Savior, the only heaven they're going to have is the heaven they have on this earth. The only hell we're going to have is the hell we have on this earth. And this earth life you have is not meant to be full of hell. It's here to, by God's mandate to be full of life and glory and abundance. Amen? And there shall be valleys, there shall be testings, there shall be pressures, even on unbelievers, but we walk through the valleys of the shadow of death, and goodness and mercy follows us every day of our life. Amen? And we shall dwell one day in the house of God forever. That's still true today. If possible, we should enter into His sanctuary the first part of every day. I encourage you guys again today, if you're not doing this yet, to not live a life that says all's well that ends well and start saying all's well that begins well. And that means the first 15 minutes of your day, just start with 15 minutes. Try to spend five minutes in the Word, five minutes in worship, and five minutes in prayer. Just try and do that. If you're not doing anything at all yet, most days, try to give 15 minutes to God of the Word, of worship, and of prayer. And see how God would breathe on that and make the rest of your day go better by sowing into 15 minutes at the very first part of your day. And you'll find that 15 minutes becomes 20 minutes, becomes 30 minutes, and becomes 35 minutes, and becomes eventually one hour a day perhaps or more. Because you're going to find yourself delighting in the presence of the Lord. Because God always recharges your batteries and gives you beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. Number three... Elijah then lets the narrative he believed about himself come only from God's Word. He let the narrative he believed about himself come only from 
God's word. First Kings chapter 19, let's read this, verse 13 and 14. So it was, when Elijah heard this, he wrapped his face in the mantle, went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice come to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said back to him again, same old song and verse. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken their covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. We all know that Elijah's lying right there. He's deceived. There's over 7,000 people still left. They have not bowed their knee to, to, to Baal yet. He's not alone. He's not by himself. There are folks around him that would help him out. He's just not going to them. That's what's happening here. Many of us have said a lie about ourselves so many times we now believe that lie. And God wants those lies annihilated and put under the blood of Jesus Christ. The truth you know will set you free. Don't believe a lie about yourself because Satan will lie to you also. Satan will agree with your lie about yourself and try and use that against you to defeat you and make you give up and go into a cave like Elijah did if he can do that. So where does this come from? There's two places this comes from. It makes you believe a lie. Number one is this. It comes from what people are saying to you or about you. What are people saying to you or about you? Even as a pastor, I get little negative comments off and on. People don't mean bad by that, but sometimes it stings. And, and I'll get folks here and family members sometimes or folks around you. They'll say some little thing that's kind of a sting type deal. And I say, well, I, I got to tell myself, that's not me. That's not who I am. I may have done that one thing one time, but I, that's, that, that does not identify me. It's not who I live like. It's not what I'm like at all. You got to tell yourself that. But also those that are, of you that are on social media, you're reading lies about yourself sometimes from people. You're believing the lies and it's giving you anxiety and giving you depression. If that takes place too many times, I encourage you stop your social media for a while. Fast from your Facebook or whatever you've got if you need to. Because folks are sometimes lying to you and telling you things about yourself that's really not true about you. Amen? Be aware of that. Know that also yourself. That people will say things to you sometimes with Satan's help that helps to bring you down. Or number two, it comes from what you have been telling yourself, telling yourself about yourself. Maybe your parents called you stupid or called you lazy or said you're never going to make it or whatever else around you. Maybe your peers said those things way back years ago, and now you believe those lies and say those lies about yourself. The psychologists and counselors of Christians also, sociologists as well, they call this a thing called rumination. Rumination defined means this, the focused attention on the symptoms of your distress as opposed to the solution to your distress. You're focusing on the symptoms of your distress as opposed to the solutions for your distress. Amen? Rumination comes from a word that means to chew the cud like a cow. And when you chew the cud, how folks know the cow's got two or three uh, stomachs? They bring that grass back up again. They've chewed once and chew it all over again. How many folks also know that that, that grass they bring up is not very pretty? It gets worse and worse and grosser every time the cow brings it up. And the same thing is true of your thoughts that are negative about yourself. The more you bring them up, the worse they get. The worse they look, the worse they taste, the more gross they are. Give those thoughts to God. Give those thoughts to the cross, amen, and say, this is not who I am in Jesus' name. A counselor whose name was Brian Tracy he said, 95% of your emotions are determined by the way you talk to yourself, even not just audibly, but in your mind. How do you talk to yourself? How do you see yourself? What do you see yourself like in four or five years from now? You need to start seeing yourself the way that God does, not the way your flesh does, not the way Satan does. Amen? So we're going to do these things now today as a homework exercise. We're going to speak these things over ourselves, okay? So let's write these things down. Let's speak over ourselves every day for a while, at least for a while. God is the king of my anxiety. God is the king of my anxiety. 
when you start feeling anxious, start feeling depressed, say those words over yourself, God is the king of my anxiety. Number two, say this, I will have peace. I will have peace. I think Isaiah 26, 3 says that he'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him because you trust in him. Number three, tell yourself, I will have victory. I will have victory. Number four, tell yourself, God is fighting for me. God is fighting for me. And number five, tell yourself, God is greater than my anxiety. God is bigger than my depression, than my anxiety. Amen. Tell yourself this on a regular basis because the Bible says there's life, there's a power of life in your tongue. Your tongue can minister death to death and life to life. Amen. I'm saying use your tongue in a good way to bring life unto yourself. Number four is this. Elijah, next of all, did this thing. He found and renewed his God-given purpose in life. He found it and renewed it once again. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15, or 13 through 18. Let's read this. Then the Lord said to him, to Elijah, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive there, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also you shall take and anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphath, of Abel Maholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 people in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal. And every mouth that has not kissed him is over 7,000 people. There are Christians around Austin, Texas, enough here to see revival break out in this city. Let's not speak death over our city. Let's not speak death over our nation. Let's speak life. There are 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal yet and have not kissed his face. They still love God. They still love Jesus. They still want revival. They still want souls to get saved. And they still know that God is for them who can really be against them. God really is, tr is truly for the people who don't know Christ as Savior. You will never come out of your anxiety if you think it's all about yourself. One of the biggest problems that brings on, I think, anxiety and depression is being too introspective. You're thinking too much of yourself, about yourself. What do folks think about me? What do I think about myself? How do folks perceive me? It's all about yourself. And so God said, get your eyes off yourself and get your eyes onto God and others. Amen? That's why it says, seek first my kingdom, my righteousness. And the first two greatest commandments are what? Number one is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then love your neighbor as you love yourself. So God says, get those first two things right, and the third thing about yourself will fall into place every single time. Victor Frankel I told you his name last week about, about this realm of stress. He says, life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by a lack of meaning and purpose. Not by circumstance, but by a lack of meaning and purpose do you find folks get depressed and full of anxiety. God's giftings, God's callings have no repentance. Never, never, it's never too late for God to get a hold of you, bring you out of any pit you're in, and puts you back into recommissioning once again in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, and also verse 16. Let's read this on the screen as well. It says this. We are the apostles. We are hard-pressed on every side, says Paul. Yet we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Paul was saying, even though I'm seeing age spots on my hands and my neck, even though my face is wrinkling, my hair is falling out, and I need false teeth, I am being renewed day by day. Though the things are wasting away around me in the natural realm, things are getting stronger in the spiritual realm, is what he's saying in his life. Amen. That's the life I want to live as well. How can Paul say this? How can Paul do this, live like this? 
Well, the answer is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, going on here, verse 17 and 18. Again, the law of proximity. Here's the answer to this. He says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but things which are not seen, for things that are seen are temporary, but things that are not seen, they are eternal. Next book I'm going to be writing here, and I get the first book finally printed, and it's almost done now, with the book cover being worked on and so forth. Next book I'm going to write on here is going to show people, I'm going to talk about how this verse seems almost ridiculous that Paul writes here. He says, even though our light afflictions, do you realize people have had their heads cut off for Jesus? Do you realize people have had their children killed before their eyes by bad, evil people that are, that are Christians? Do you realize that? And what's Paul call that? Light afflictions. How can he do that? Because Paul has a revelation, this is not all there is. There's a glory up in heaven that far outweighs anything Satan or the world can throw at us. And it is so big and so great, it makes these things seem like light afflictions in the, re in the rear view mirror of eternity in the days ahead. Yeah. Amen? Paul saw that, and Paul lived by that, and Paul got strength from that. No matter how low your valley may be, God can pull you out of that valley and pull you through that valley in Jesus' name. Number five, last of all, before we close in prayer, Elijah maintained his life with godly relationships. He maintained life with godly relationships. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 says this, So Elijah departed from there. He found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12th row of, of oxen. Then Elijah passed by him, throws his mantle on him. And you're going to find out that the first four things, if they had not been done by, if they had been done by Elijah, but he left out this last thing of finding a godly relationship, he probably would not have made it into what God called restoration back into his life. Because you see, when you throw a mantle off your body onto somebody else's body in Israel, it means you're now in covenant with them. They're now my friend. They're now my buddy. We have agape love. We are now joined together. What's mine is his. What's his is mine. Who I fight, he fights. Who I love, he loves. People of covenant is what's being talked about here. If you get, get the first four things right, but leave the last one out about relationships, you may not make it after all. I still encourage you guys that are out there watching online, you folks that are out there in social distancing still for whatever reasons, get yourselves back into some kind of a small group or into some kind of a Bible study group or around believers at the YMCA or even at the bowling alley, but do something there to get yourself with other believers, Christians, those that are filled with God's Spirit, because we do need each other. God made us not to be by ourselves, but to be in groups of people loving one another. Amen. I'm going to have Greg come back to the platform and help me out here, the worship team as well, if you would help us out. We're going to pray for those that are watching online right now and those that are here live in this, in this service, anxiety and depression we're talk talking about this morning. We're living in very, very peculiar times. We live in a time where churches are packed out one week and like this the next week. It happens all over our country right now. And it's happening all over the world as well. South Africa is the same exact way. People are up, downs, left, right, sideways. Things are just going on. It's just real mumble jumble. And one day they're bombing Israel. Next day, Hawaii is burning up. Things are taking place all around us in these kind of ways. God is going to tell us and God's going to show us it's time for people to become stabilized and stable in Him. And not let the circumstances around us dictate, dictate depression, anxiety, ruling over our lives any longer. Let's bow our head. Let's close our eyes. Let's pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to have His way among us. Because you may be a person here today that's suffering and on a regular basis from anxiety, from depression. You may be a person where God is, it seems distant to you, not speaking to you like you used to, perhaps the past. And God is saying here, it's time to look at these five ways to get out of the cave. You might have found ways to get into a cave, but God says there's ways to get out of a cave. I want to say it again. Number one, 
Do you need to adjust some things in your body, in your flesh? Do you need more sleep? Do you need better food? Do you need more rest? Let God give you a balance, give you a schedule to live by, to get your body back in strength and back in peace once again. Then number two, cultivate God's presence. And find worship tapes or worship CDs or worship podcasts or whatever. Listen to worship. Praise God. Worship God. Bless the Lord. Sing with your own mouth and thank Him for His goodness, for His kindness, for His blessings upon us. Cultivate God's presence. Then number, number four was I believe and believe what God's Word says about me, not what Satan says, not what I say. What does God's Word say about me is what i got to find out. i got to agree with God, not my flesh, not the devil. Agree with what God says. And then last of all, number five is this. Let me find, oh God, godly friends. Let me keep godly friends. Let me be, have folks around me that can be those sounding boards, that can be those people, God, of encouragement, that can pray with me, love me, stand with me, oh God, by your spirit. So I'm not an island to myself, but I, oh God, am a person who needs others around me as well. Father, I pray, God, today that you take people that are here in the congregation, those that are watching online, and help them, God, make practical steps to come out of the cave of depression or anxiety and not be overcome, God, by mountains, by circumstances, by things, oh God, that are negative. In the name of Jesus, praise you, God. We thank you for it. You know, my son, my, my, my brother, who died over probably over 15 years ago now, eight years older than I was, manic depressant. All they knew about back in his era was take pills, take medication. And all it did for him was make him, made him gain a whole lot of weight, become lethargic, and just kind of, all he could do is lay around and just kind of exist. And finally, he found, he found him dead one day in his bed. He'd been there for three days because nobody went to see him. He was all by himself out in the country rural area. And I saw, and I saw through him. And the Holy Spirit told me about about a month before he died, I was going to contact a small church close to him. I was going to find a locate a small church and say, please make my brother your project. Just go to him and take him cookies or invite him out to lunch or invite him to church service or drive him to church. Make him your project. But unfortunately, those things never came to pass. He's 500 miles away, so I called his kids up as well. and. They helped out a little bit at that time. They were very immature. They were teenagers. So everything fell through the cracks. My brother died. I know he should live a lot longer than 50, 53 years old. He was not a good age to die. He had a lot more years to live. Maybe you know someone yourself going through depression, going through anxiety. They may need you to be that rock and be that source and that help in their lives. And I pray that God will give you the strength, wisdom, ability and the, uh, the unction to go to them and help them and be there for them in their times of need. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet now. Let's have our, let's have our prayer partners come to the front as well. The prayer partners again are here to pray prayers of agreement with those that are here. We ask God to take and meet needs in people's lives. If you're out there today and you're watching online, again, I encourage you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just find a place to pray. Say, Lord, I may be lonely, may be lost, but I do know I need a Savior. All you got to do is say, Jesus, I come to you in your name. I say, take sin from me, be my God, be my Lord, be my Savior. Come in my heart, be the one who takes and makes me God one of your children. I receive you and your forgiveness this day in my life. You just sit and pray a prayer like that and mean that prayer. God will save you. God will take and come into your life. Be your Savior. I'm going to let Greg go ahead and just lead us in a song here. You can dismiss us in prayer when you're finished. I think Jack has something too.
I just want to say a word real quick. Pastor Mike, I appreciate that word today. Many years ago, I was preaching at a minister's conference. And um, some of the ministers were kind of exalted themselves. And the Lord gave me a word. And this really is a word for everybody. Because we're to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Um, and the word was, it's not about you. It's about Him. over our city and over our lives. Lord, everywhere we go, may your name 
be lifted high. We bless you.